Okay. Uh, so today is the last topic for the prerequisites for this class, which were statistics, uh, topics in statistics. So we have talked about control design. We have talked about linear algebra optimization, controller design. We have been talking about statistics. That's the final topic. And after that, we will go right into um, the cyber attack detection and mitigation. So today, the uh, topic is hypothesis testing. And let me remind you what we were doing in the previous class. So there is H0, which is the null hypothesis. There is HA, which is the alternate hypothesis. There is test statistics. Let me call it ZN which is a function hn of y1 to yn. y1 to yn are the random variables that you observe. And then there is a rejection region. Which is basically some interval a1, a2. There is probability of type 1 error. which is alpha n and probability of type 2 error which is beta n. Everyone remembers what type 1 error was. Type 1 error is that H0 is true, but based on the data and the test statistics and the rejection region, we, uh, we stated that the alternate hypothesis is true, HA is true. And the type 2 error is HA is true, alternate hypothesis is true, but based on the data, based on the test statistics, and based on the rejection region, we argued that the null hypothesis is true. So you make a wrong choice of, uh, of hypothesis, and that's type 1 error and type 2 error. OK? Now, what all things is something that you decide? So let's say you have the process that gets generated from some, uh, some sensor. So that, that is what you're observing. I'm observing the temperature. So at every hour of the day, I'm observing the temperature of the sensor. And based on that, I come up with a real number, which is called the test statistics, right? So then we check whether Zn is in between this region, then H0 is true. If it is outside of this region, then HA is true, or vice versa, OK? So in this particular problem, you cannot decide what these values are going to be. That comes from a sensor. And once you pick the sensor, that's it. Those values get decided. Those random variables get decided. What you can pick is HN. Okay, What's the test statistic you want to use? What's the mapping from the observed quantities to some real number? So this HN is what you can pick. Okay, And we will see some examples of HN for different types of null and alternate hypothesis in today's class. And then, of course, the rejection region. Uh, you can pick, uh, typically, the rejection region would be of the form of minus infinity to tau or tau to infinity. So the thresholds are something that you can pick. That's in your control. What about n? What is the number of samples needed to make the decision? Is that in your control or not? What do you think? If 
सॉरी कैन यू दैट्स राइट सो इफ एन इज वेरी लार्ज यू कैन मेक अ मच मोर एक्यूरेट एनालिसिस ऑफ विच हाइपोथिस इज ट्रू बट द क्वेश्चन इज हाउ डू यू पिक एन वॉट डिटर्मिन्स एन लाइक हाउ मेनी सैम्पल यू कैन पिक okay that's a good answer so if we start seeing some pattern then we pick n according to yeah, our experience with that pattern okay that's a reasonable answer anything else maybe uh, if n is completely random like like uh, the data set we don't have any pattern yes then we will try to like get the sample as high as possible uh, right as high as possible means how high <laughs> <laughs> let me give you a concrete example that is exactly correct you want to pick it as high as possible but then how high so let me give you a concrete example so if you are so consider this situation you have an autonomous car and there is some attack happening on the autonomous car or or some fault happening in the autonomous vehicle uh it has been done in the research in human factors research that a human driver if you alert a human driver it will take him or her about 7 seconds to figure out what's going on on the road and then take control of the wheel like start making good decisions so 7 seconds is that that number that threshold of course for some people that may be higher for some people that may be shorter but 7 seconds is what the average is let's say 10 seconds Now suppose we want to detect an attack or a some problem with the camera okay and camera is running at 100 milliseconds interval so every 100 millisecond it captures the image sends that image to a gpu gpu crunches the numbers and figures out okay there is a traffic light its color is red there is a cat on the road there is a small child you know playing on the road with football or whatever and there is a bicyclist driving and all that stuff so now if something has gone wrong with the camera it must be detected within 70 samples right uh, so 70 n is that n is has to be less than equal to 70 you cannot really change that because you want to alert the driver and then the driver will take control of the vehicle and so 70 turns out to be that number in this particular situation well it has to be actually less than 70 much less than 70 because you want to give the driver enough time to figure out what's happening and then taken appropriate action with the vehicle so many a times this parameter this parameter n has to be like there are some specifications for the system depending on some other factors and from those specification you have to extract what value of n would be more appropriate for this particular application now consider the another situation so this is an autonomous driving situation where n is equal to 70 or something less than 70 let's say 35 um so n has to be less than equal to 35 and if you remember a camera would give you a million dimensional input right so for a million dimensional something has gone wrong in the million dimensional input you only have 35 seconds to 35 time steps to figure out so you really have to have a very strong hn to be able to figure that out So one of the things that typically happens if you are driving through a national park or something you will find that your windshield in your vehicle has a lot of bugs bug splatter. So what happens is a bug is on the road you're driving the vehicle at 70 miles an hour the bug hits the uh, hits the windshield and then it splatters okay and uh, and so you can have that situation on camera as well there's no reason why camera should not have bugs bug splatter if you're driving through uh, a national park so you will have 35 samples to detect whether there is a bug splatter on your on your camera or not or you're driving through a muddy road and the mud hits the camera and then it sticks to the camera right so you have 35 time steps to detect that and say look the camera is unreliable driver must take control of the vehicle okay so it's really very difficult in those situations but probably the kind of faults that you are looking for uh, maybe there is an easier test statistics like if it is 
if some part of your screen is completely blacked out, like in the camera image, it's very easy to detect that and you don't really need 35 samples to detect it. You can actually detect it within 10 or 15 samples. So, so n is an important number. In the case of, uh, consider the following situation. Let's say you have an adversary who has gotten into your credit card database, not your credit card database, but some credit card company's database, and it's sending the information about the transaction or the information about the credit cards uh, at the rate of 100, in, 100 information bits every second. Now the amount of, if you look at the volume of information that is getting transferred, it's, it's huge for credit card companies. And so if it increases by 100 or 200 or, th or, or, or even 1,000 bits per second, nobody is actually going to notice it, right? So in those situations, if you want to reliably detect, you really have to have very large number of samples, which is why it's very difficult to detect uh, database leakages, you know, because you really need a large number of samples and then you can figure out, okay, there is some abnormal activity going on. Um, uh, so, so in those cases, you really need, like there is just no way to get around it. You really need very large N because the adversary is intelligent. Now what would a non-intelligent adversary do? They will start dumping the entire data, pushing it upstream, and then it's very easy to detect because suddenly there is a huge volume of data getting transferred from the server and you know that there is something fishy going on. This is not usual. So, so intelligent uh, adversaries would just send chunks of data at very short intervals um, so, that, so that it's not detected by a firewall or by any intrusion detection system. So, so you really have a hard, like there are situations with, where things are very hard. If I re uh, remember from Stuxnet, Stuxnet was a virus that was affecting the centrifuge in Iran. And uh, what happened in that particular Stuxnet virus is it's slowing down the centrifuge every 28 days, okay? Now, imagine the number of samples you need to detect that there is a virus present in that system. It's going to be insane because that event happens once in 28 days. There is just no way for you to detect that. So, you know, I mean, of course, we are talking about statistics and all that stuff, but you know, if you have an intelligent adversary, all of the statistics stuff is going to fail because what it. I mean, uh, some systems have some failure checks, right? Because the centrifuge is slowing down every 28 days. Yes. Like, you can only figure out after a year that something is wrong with the. But there might be some conditions for the centrifuge to run, right? It has to run for some time or some rotations. Yes. And if it, it's not achieving it, we can detect it, I guess. So c it. consider this, you are a centrifuge operator and you have run centrifuge all your life. Yeah. And every time it runs normally, it runs perfectly. But suddenly, today, you notice that the centrifuge is rotating at a much slower speed. What would your detection be? Your detection would be this centrifuge has gone bad, let me just order a new centrifuge and replace this. And you will do this for an entire year and all your centrifuge will get replaced by the end of the year and then you will say, you know, this is unusual. I've never had in my life, like one centrifuge can fail in a year, but never in my life I've had like a 30 centrifuge failing uh, over a span of one year. It's just very unusual and something must have gone wrong. And uh, then you go back and you check your instruction manual, have we installed this centrifuge correctly or is there some error that we made? Is the voltage coming in correctly or is there a problem with the voltage? Is the current coming in correctly or is there some problem with the current? So on and so forth. Only after you have striked out all the obvious answers, then you will think that, oh, I think there is a computer virus here which is slowing down the centrifuge. You know, and that's exactly how things evolved in the case of Stuxnet. Uh, it's not a virus, it's actually a worm. But that's what has happened in that particular instance. So, so in some cases, it's very difficult to get data. And one of the things that you will learn through your experience, and this is something that I learned through my experience, it's very hard to get data from anomalous situations because the anomaly happens very rarely in any system. So, 
if I want to know the number of times uh, students check their email every second, I can get that data from OSU. But the number of times adversary is exfiltrating emails to their server, it's very hard to get that data set. And when you don't have the data set, you don't know what test statistics you should be constructing to detect that sort of attack. And what should the rejection region be, and uh, what should your thresholds for type 1 error and type 2 error be. So those are the practical situations that you will have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis when you have a situation where the data is very, very sparse. And uh, we don't know how to deal with it. It's a very difficult problem to deal with. And people are still trying to come up with theory about how to deal with those situations where data is very hard to come by. Anomalous data is hard to come by. The usual data is, is, is free. It's, 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 it's in millions. So you are literally finding a needle in a haystack. So even if people are exfiltrating emails, uh, let's say one email per second, it's very hard to detect. And even if there is anomaly in the data, you are essentially looking for a needle in a haystack, and that's very difficult. OK. Any question about this? OK, so n is something that is thrown at you from, from the top, uh, depending on various considerations. And based on n, the probability of type 1 error and type 2 error, so again, you are given an n, you want to control alpha n, you can do that, but then your beta n cannot be controlled. So there is only one of the two things you can, no, out of three things, n, so you have three things, n, alpha n, and beta n. Typically, in uh, control systems, you would try to control these two parameters, so n comes from the top, alpha n is something that's given to you, beta n is, automatically, it automatically gets decided by the choice of n and by the choice of alpha n. Okay, so, and the reason for that is, if you have limited number of data, and you have picked your thresholds in such a way that alpha n is 0 0.05, there is only so much you can do in terms of removing type 2 error. So, you can of course, get a very small value of alpha n and very small value of beta n, then your n has to go up significantly. Uh, you want uh, a small value of n and a small value of alpha n, your beta n will be very high. And if you have a small value of n and a small value of beta n, then your alpha n will go very high. It's just the nature of things. So if you're making fewer type 1 error, you will make a lot of type 2 errors, okay? with a limited uh, size, data set size. So that's a trade-off, again, which you need to understand. So if you want to detect bug splatter on the camera within 35 uh, image samples, um, and you want it with very high reliability, you want your alpha n to be 0 0.01, your beta n will automatically get decided, and it will be, let's say, 0 0.10. <coughs> and what that means is, what is type 2 error? Type 2 error is HA is true, alternate hypothesis is true, but you went ahead with null hypothesis. So if it is 0 0.1, if beta n is 0 0.1, what that means is there is no bug splatter uh, on, this, on the camera, but based on the data, you determine that there is a bug splatter on the camera, and therefore uh, you did whatever you needed to do. In this case, yield the control to the human driver. Now, of course, from a drivability point of view, a human driver doesn't want to have a lot of type 2 errors. What that means is uh, everything is going on fine, but the camera is telling me that, oh, I need to take control because something has gone wrong. So people don't want to have that uh, situation, in which case, uh, you want to control n, alpha n, and beta n, and that's a hopeless situation. You just cannot do it. Okay, so, so you design a system based on all the different engineering parameters, and then the customer comes and says, you know, your, your system sucks big time because it just keeps giving me alarm, and all of those alarms are false alarms. What happens over long periods of time, people start ignoring those false alarms. This is exactly what happens in the case of Tesla, where the Tesla gives out like Tesla has an autopilot feature, and it gives out alarms every now and then. Many a time those alarms are useful. 
many a times those alarms are just just problematic and so people don't listen to those alarms and if you go to youtube you will find a lot of videos about how people are not like they they went to the back seat and the tesla is driving on the highway even though that's something that's not that's not allowed from tesla's terms and conditions and those are the situation where the human drivers are just ignoring all the alerts coming out of the car because they just felt out of their experience that the car is very safe and it can drive on its own on the highway and there is no problem and of course there has been a couple of fatalities in those situations where the driver actually died because it it collided with some object so so that's the human factor side where when human factor comes in you want to control n alpha and n beta n and then every all all hell breaks loose then you can't do you should just uh, raise your arm and say you know i can't do it just hire someone else to do it <laughs> uh because uh, it's just impossible okay so that's some uh, background some engineering background about where how how this gets applied now let's look at some specific hypothesis tests uh for for various uh, problems okay so uh let me remind you so y bar is 1 over n summation of y i and s square is 1 over n minus 1 summation of y i minus y bar square i equals 1 to n i equals 1 to n so all of this was something we have studied several times now so based on the data y1 to y n i can compute y bar and i can compute s square now i have h not which is mu equals to theta not and i have ha mu greater than theta not so i have a bunch of iid random variables and my hypothesis null hypothesis is that the mean of that random variable is theta not alternate hypothesis is that the mean is greater than theta not the test statistic zn is actually oh i should write n here so y bar n minus theta not over sn and the rejection region is is a uh, tau infinity what this means is if zn less than equal to tau h not is true zn greater than tau h a is true oh tau is greater than 0 okay so sn is square root of sn square sn square is computed here and i'm using sn here which is the square root of that sn square the term there so i have this hypothesis i have set it up this way i have a uh, test statistics this is my hn of y1 to yn you can notice that this hn is constructed using the mean and the covariance the estimated covariance and it takes in as input the entire data set whatever data set you have collected so far and then the rejection region is tau comma infinity 
Uh, what that means is if Zn is less than tau, which means that the Zn doesn't lie in the rejection region, then you accept the null hypothesis. If Zn is in the rejection region, you reject the null hypothesis and uh, accept the alternate hypothesis. And of course, there is a associated probability of type one error and probability of type two error. And uh, if you, you can pick whatever n and alpha n you want, and the beta n will automatically get decided based on the, what is known as concentration of measures for this particular problem. Okay, everyone understands this, yes? So, so in the first case, this means that alpha uh, has a low probability. Well, it depends on the value of tau. So if I pick tau to be 100, mm -hmm. then I'm almost always going to say that H naught is true. Okay, so if H naught is true, this means that the, the type one error is low, right? Uh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Low probability. Okay. Correct. Right. So, uh, if if you pick tau to be a large number here, uh, so if let me just write it, tau is greater than zero. So, if tau large. alpha n is small and beta n is large. Okay. So if we call that as like y1 to yn, yes. how do you reach to the interstatistic setup? Like if there is anything, how there, I mean there is the whole set of courses in statistics department which comes up with test statistics for various problems. There's a whole field of test statistics. And one of the things we do in our research is construct test statistics for some specific problems that we are facing. Yeah. So this requires a lot of mathematical background. I, I don't want to say that it's something you can just do, you know, in one, mid, one afternoon. You have to take a lot of courses and then you develop those intuition for specific examples and then you, take those examples to the industry and then you try to come up with new test statistics that would help you in that particular problem. Uh, so in my case, if you ask me, I cannot come up with those test statistics because I have not taken those many statistics classes, but my students can, right? So I rely on them to come up with useful test statistics for the problems that we are interested in solving. And, and it takes six months to a year to come up with a good test statistics after doing a lot of research and trial and error and all that stuff. For a particular problem. For a particular problem. We cannot generalize, like, for, like we can generalize that for similar type of problem. You cannot. So some of these test statistics were developed in 1950s or 60s. Okay, so it's just been, people have been using it since then. Uh, so it's sort of second nature to most of the statistics people. But if you have to come up with new test statistics, then of course you have to spend a lot of time thinking about the problem. Yeah. There's a lot of things. So for instance, what's the generation, what's the data, uh, what's the distribution of Y1 to Yn? Are they independent? Are they not independent? If they are not independent, what's the mixing time? So mixing time is something some complicated concept uh, in Markov chain. So what's the mixing time? If the mixing time is small, what sort of test statistics should we develop? If the mixing time is large, what sort of test statistics we should develop and all that stuff. So it's, it's a bit complicated process. And yes, once you are trained in that way for six, seven years, generating a new test statistics will not be that difficult. But you know, I'm not sure how many of you are going to take, do a PhD in statistics in order to be able to build new test statistics. So the reason why I'm covering all this stuff is, you know, not because this thing is going to be useful for some cyber attack detection, but the reason why I'm covering it is in the future, you can open a statistics book, go to the appropriate chapter, like figure out which chapter you should go to, go to that chapter, look at the entire discussion and figure things out for yourself, okay? 
And uh, towards the end of October, I will tell you some things about our own work that we have done and what test statistics we came up with and, and all the answers surrounding that. So we'll do that at the end of the, for cyber attack detection, that will be done at the end of October. Okay. Any question on this stuff? No? Let me change it a little bit. I want to do mu less than theta naught. I have the same Zn. Zn doesn't change. But my rejection region would be minus infinity minus tau. Tau is greater than 0. And if Zn greater than minus tau, H0 is true. Okay, let me make another change now. Mu, which is the mean, is not equal to theta naught. And in this case, your rejection region is minus infinity minus tau over 2 union tau over to infinity. So what that means is if absolute value of Zn less than tau, H0 is true. If absolute value of Zn is greater than or equal to tau, HA is true. So one question I have for you guys is we are thinking of all these hypothesis tests in the context of attack detection and stuff or in terms of autonomous control systems. Can you think of other examples where like what I want you to think is under what conditions what happened in 1950s or what happened in 1940s because of which people tried to come up with these kind of analysis. Something happened in 1940s and 50s, and it became important to investigate these hypothesis tests. Can someone, does someone want to guess what happened in that era? I guess like the Soviet Union and the Russians. Sorry? Like people were in the process of developing computers and yes. things. Yes. Yes. Of the fact, like at that time, computers were not there and yes. things were not connected with each other. Uh -huh. There were some anomalies, like there might be some anomalies. Uh, right. So, uh, yeah, so in what cases anomalies would be very costly? In which situation would anomalies be very costly? Because of which people started looking into it very, like in an in depth fashion.
manufacturing okay particularly manufacturing of vehicles trucks you know some of these precision engineering tools so if you had bought let's consider the situation you were a ho horse cart owner in 1880s okay and that was the premium mode for transportation and one of your wheel broke and you went somewhere and you asked them hey this is the wheel it broke can you make me another wheel and they'll come up with another wheel and they'll put it back in and now you have one wheel with radius uh, 10 centimeter not not centimeters whatever one meter and you have other wheel with uh, radius 1.1 meter okay and now things are wobbling on the road so that's the situation where the manufacturing is not perfect things are not standardized and and you could have small errors between one batch to another batch now comes 1950s and people are making cars and the cars are driving at 70 miles an hour or whatever like some obscene speed which was unheard of and reliability is the biggest thing you don't want your car to break down in the middle of the highway which was pretty common in 1950s okay and so people were still using the vehicle but they were very annoyed that you know the car is breaking down every like whatever thousand miles or two thousand miles or five thousand miles so what the car manufacturers wanted to do, particularly Toyota, what they wanted to do was come up with exact specification for every part of the vehicle, so that if the specifications are not met, uh, you are just not going to use those parts in the vehicle. And that basically elongated the life of the vehicle or life of the parts of the vehicle, and they could give extended warranty coverage to their customers. So now if you go and buy a car and they give you extended warranty coverage, that's because of all this hypothesis test that's running for every part that goes inside the car. And they are going to check very carefully that this wheel is supposed to be 15 inches or 15 inches in diameter. Uh, is it really 15 inches in diameter or not? It shouldn't be, it can be 15.001 inch and it can be 14.999 inch, but it can't be like 15.2 inches and or 14.8 inches. So they really make very stringent specifications so that even if, so that you, everything is replaceable. Like I went and got my wheel changed just a couple of days back and my car is from 2011, but because the specifications, I could still get that thing done today and not have a issue with my, my drivability. And that's because of hypothesis tests that happens at every moment in the entire manufacturing process. So Toyota learned it from US scientists and they implemented it in their factory and, uh, and, and they became one of the most reliable car companies in the world. In fact, you get a student, but when you go out, uh, the first car that you are likely going to buy would be a Toyota car because of its reliability and low cost. So the way they get high reliability with low cost is because of these hypothesis tests. So it has a lot of applications. And so if you read most of the books on statistical, uh, like hypothesis testing, the best books are in the statistical quality control, where the quality control basically means quality control for manufactured goods. Okay, so that's some history. And now, of course, we are using this entire theory that was developed in the context of manufacturing. We are trying to use it for cyber attack detection. And uh, that's very beautiful. Okay, so, so these are the, some simple test statistics. Uh, now let's look at a bit more complicated H0 and HA. So, Y1 to Yn are IID Gaussian vector uh, and then HA is Y1 to YN are not Gaussian.
Okay, so I am now asking a very complicated question. So in the earlier case, I kind of knew the distribution. I, I just wanted to know what the mean of the distribution looks like. And we looked at some different types of test statistics for uh, different types of alternate hypothesis. Now, uh, now the problem is a bit more complicated. Now the problem is I don't even know what the distribution of the data is. Is it Gaussian? Uh, according to, I don't know, like uh, is the outside weather Gaussian or, or is it uh, non-Gaussian? I, I don't know. There is no way for me to figure that out. So how do I test? If, if, if you come and tell me that, hey, look, the outside temperature, if you plot it, uh, if you compute the histogram, over the last one year, it's going to be a Gaussian distributed. There is no way for me to check that. So how do I know that what you are saying is correct or, or not? So here is a test statistics, a very complicated test statistics, by the way. Uh, so let uh, x1 to x, x1 to xn be iid Gaussian 0, 1. And then I'm going to define an order statistic. So x1 is min of x1 to xn, x2 is min of x1 to xn minus x1, and so on. Right, so I remove my uh, minimum value from this set, and then I take the second minimum value, and then x3 will be the third minimum value, and so on and so forth. So I constructed this x1, x2, all the way up to xn. This xn is actually max of x1 to xn. Okay. Everything is clear so far? Now here is the test statistics. Zn, Hn, Y1 to Yn is going to be summation Ai Xi. summation y i minus y bar square. A i are known coefficients. I think this is known as Shapiro-Wilk normality test. So it tests whether a given sequence of random variables is IID Gaussian uh, with uh, zero mean and uh, unit what is it called, unit uh, variance, is, is that a, uh, the random variable or not? And this is the way to test it. I don't even know how they came up with this algorithm, okay, and I didn't even attempt to find out. But this is just something that was discovered in 1965, 
and I have just assumed it to be true because it's more than 50 year old algorithm. Sorry? This statistic is named this or? Yes, that's the, that's the name of this entire test. So it includes the test statistics and then it includes the, there is this threshold tau and then if it is less than tau then it's normal, if it is greater than tau it's not normal. Okay, so it checks whether a sequence of random variables is Gaussian or not. That's what the underlying goal for this is. And the reason why I'm giving you this expression is to just see how, how people think about these test statistics and how they are constructed, even though they may not necessarily be useful for the cyber attack situation. Or it may be, we, do, we don't know. We, maybe there is some situation where this is what you want to check to detect whether there is an attack or no attack on the system. Okay, any question so far? No? Uh, let me start with, let me give you another uh, hypothesis test. So, H naught is Y1 to Yn have our IID and have PDF probability density function F0 and H1 is Y1 to Yn our IID and have PDF F1. So I have two different density functions, F0 and F1 with the same support and I want to figure out whether the random variables are coming from this probability density function or this probability density function. <coughs> So you define the log likelihood, like likelihood ratio, which is L of Yn or Yi equals to log of F1 of Yi over F2 of yi. Oh, f0, f0 in the denominator. Okay, and you define a Q-sum score, cumulative, this is the test statistics, cumulative sum score, which is uh, no, I don't want to use, I've been using Zn, Zn plus 1 equals to Zn plus L, let me use I, So this is plus means I will take the max of this comma zero. So I'll just take the positive part. If it is negative, I'll set it to zero. If it is positive, then I'll take the positive number to be zi plus one. So this is known as the Q-sum algorithm or Q-sum score. And Q-sum is a very large class of algorithms where you define some sort of cumulative sum that you can update as new data arises. 
So remember, you start with z0 equal to 0, and you're observing y1, and then y2, and then y3. And you can keep updating the Qsum score. And if the Qsum score goes above a threshold, you say that, OK, the, the uh, y1 to yn are coming from f1. If, on the other hand, if Qsum is below so, some threshold, then you say that y1 to yn are iid, and they have PDF f0. Okay, so that's the beauty of QSUM. We will study a different types of QSUM algorithms uh, for attack detection, but this is where it comes, like this is one of the first QSUM algorithms where they define accumulate. The beauty of this particular uh, uh, test statistics is you can update it as new data arises. That's the beauty. That's why QSUM score is so useful because you don't have to have the entire data set at the same time. You can just keep updating it. And uh, I have yes. So is this QSUM score similar as a Z score, like the same thing? Z what score? is the green score? I, I don't know. Like, uh, I was solving this question from quiz yesterday. Uh, the quiz, uh, the question regarding uh, like confidence in the Right, the right. Yeah, so we had to find 95% Correct. Correct. And I searched on the internet, like I got a formula that's me, that's me plus minus z yes. multiplied by sigma yes. over root over n. Yes, yes. I applied that formula, but I couldn't find the answer like in the option. Right, so that goes back to our first, first uh, hypothesis test where we had this um, uh, y bar minus theta naught over sn square. So if you look at if your y bar n lies between theta n, no. So 95% confidence interval, this is how you, it's different from this, by the way. Yes. Correct. Yeah. Correct. That is how I calculated it later. Like yes. Once I calculated it with that formula, I didn't get the answer. Right. So, yeah. so, yeah. so this y bar n minus uh, theta naught, or I should say, if theta naught is less than equal to y bar, so suppose you have computed y bar n and plus two. Sn. Maybe I have to multiply it by square root of n. So this is the two sigma, and this is my uh, mean. And if theta naught is, there is a 95%. Con I am 95% confident that maybe square root of n should not be there y bar n minus 2 sn uh, should there be a square root of n here I don't think so because uh, because this has very small variance for n large this has small variance and this is an unbiased estimate of the Sigma so you want so if you want the 95% confidence interval for theta naught like what is the mean of this distribution it's y bar n minus 2 sn and y bar n plus 2 sn. Now you are talking about square root of n, so I'll have to go back and read wh where exactly square root of n comes here. Because this is an unbiased estimate of mean, this is the unbiased estimate of the variance. Because uh, there were uh, the samples that you gave, mm -hmm. and uh, when I searched like, uh, how to calculate uh, this confidence interval, mm -hmm. then I got the result, like we can calculate it by mean plus minus z and z it was written like z, z score i see right and right the value of z was uh, for 95 percent confidence interval it was 1.96 okay and then we multiplied it by uh, the standard deviation right and divided it by the number. right 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 yeah i think we are talking about a little bit uh, different concept so i'm talking about the hypothesis test 95 percent confidence interval and you are talking about the for a Gaussian distribution, what's the 95% confidence interval? But those are very related concepts. They are not very independent. But, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, it's used in various uh, situations.
Okay, any other question on this Q sum score? Uh, uh, yes. So, so the, the uh, threshold that decides which one is true yes. is, is represented by the L, uh, that ratio, or the Z? N no, Z, Z. This is the, this is the uh, test statistics. This is test statistics. Uh -huh. And then you have Zn less than tau. Then H not true, Zn greater than tau, H1 is true. So here we have Zi plus 1. Correct. And I is the, the, the number of samples. Number of samples you, are, you have seen so far. Okay, okay. You know, so, so of course you want to have at least a few number of samples. You don't want to start raising alarm at the first instance itself. Okay. So this is how it typically evolves. So this is your i. This would be your n. So, and this is your z i. So what will happen, this is your threshold, tau. I should actually write not as a z n, but z i. So, here what you typically see is this is what you are going to see. So this is going to So there is a change. Some change happened here after which the Q sum score blew up. And so which means that your underlying distribution of y has changed uh, at that time. So that is used for the change detection part, but uh, if you if you are just interested in this particular hypothesis, not the change detection, then you will have a graph that looks something like very similar to this. So, so this is what it's going to look like. If uh, so, if it is if it has gone above the threshold, then you say that H1 is true. If it is remains below the threshold, then you say that H0 is true. So, but but you can continue to compute. R zi as new data comes in. So that's why you usually plot it as a function of time, because you can update so zi. It only, it only depends on, the, on a single previous uh, Correct. Increment. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other question on this? OK. Actually, that uh, I wanted to talk about change detection, but uh, I guess I've already plotted it. So this is the case when you do, this is the situation for detecting whether you are uh, according to F0 distribution or F1 distribution, but if you are doing a change detection, so change, this is what the change detection does. Uh, Oh, I think I'm, what time is this class supposed to get over? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm way above time. So I'll talk about change detection in the next class. That's a very small topic for hypothesis testing. And after I finish change detection, then I'll talk about different types of, con like different examples, case studies. So that's all for today. Thank you.